uh, thank you all for, uh, for being here, and especially to Svonko and Kepa for, uh, for inviting me. Uh, what I want to do today is to present something that uh, hopefully someday will be part of my, my thesis. And uh, I have to warn you that many of the ideas that I'm going to, to present today are still quite primitive and provisional. And this is why I think that it's actually a good uh, opportunity to, to present something to get as well some criticisms and some, um, some feedback in general. Uh, I'm going to speak about uh, natural kinds. And more precisely, what I want to do is to uh, argue against a quite extended assumption on the literature of natural kinds, according to which any account of natural kind has to provide the criteria to make a clear distinction between natural and non-natural kinds. And what I want to say is that these uh, dichotomical accounts are actually problematic in different ways and that we should instead endorse um, a gradual notion of, of naturalness. So first of all, where does this uh, idea that naturalness is something dichotomical comes from? Well, I think it's, it responds actually to, to some basic intuition that uh, can check if we go to look into the world and we compare between the kinds that can be found. If you compare, for instance, the collection things smaller than Jupiter to the kind gold, well, it does seem that there is there a difference between the, for instance, the homogeneity of one and the heterogeneity of the other, because, for instance, in the case of things smaller than Jupiter, it seems that the only thing these particulars have in common is particularly that, this, uh, the property of being smaller than Jupiter, whereas in the case of gold, uh, we can agree that there are many other properties that instances of gold will share. So dichotomical accounts of natural kinds have attempted to uh, make ex explicit this intuition. And things, well, the way I see things, when we get a bit uh, deeper in this uh, issue and we try to hear are some more kinds, we will find that this intuition is actually more difficult to formulate because, well, it's not so easy uh, to decide where in here we are going to draw this line separating uh, natural and non-natural kinds. And we could, of course, are add uh, much more kinds to this list. I don't know if you can see there, but I added uh, stone, quadruped, reptile, solanum, tuberosum, which is a fancy way to say potato, uh, gold. There are many different kinds. And what I, what, I think it, what I think is that it is actually problematic to draw uh, a line in here. For instance, many accounts of natural kinds um, draw a line somewhere in here where these things on the left would be non-natural kinds, whereas the things on the right, more or less, roughly, uh, like uh, biological species, chemical elements, physical entities, more or less scientific categories would be considered natural, uh, according to some accounts. We could be more restrictive and consider that only um, chemical elements and uh, the entities that physics work with are actually natural kinds. So what I want to do today is to um, uh, consider two different accounts of natural kinds that are uh, each of which corresponds more or less to, to, to those that draw these two distinctions and argue that uh, none of them works uh, when it comes to draw, drawing this ontological distinction uh, for each, each fails, I will argue for different reasons. So the, the presentation will be uh, structured in the following way. First, I will consider natural kind essentialism. I will present uh, more or less what it is. Then I will present as well an argument against it. 
the argument is not mine, it's actually one that is uh, widely uh, used, I think, to argue against natural kind essentialism, then I will turn to consider epistemic accounts of natural kinds that have um, a particular interest in defining natural kinds um, by taking into account the role that natural kinds are supposed to play in a scientific practice. I will argue that epistemic accounts um, set, in general, two conditions for naturalness, which is the first uh, projectability, that is, for, in a, for epistemic accounts, uh, a kind, in order to be considered natural, it has to be projectable. And the second condition is that they, these accounts uh, identify scientific categories with a natural kind. That is, uh, in order to be natural, a kind has to be as well a scientific category. So what, what I will do is endorse the, the first condition. I will say that it is actually a very good way to characterize uh, natural kinds, but I will reject the second one. This will be the third part where I will argue against the second condition that, that identifies scientific categories with natural kinds. And I will say that what, uh, uh, once we reject this second condition, what we get is the gradual notion of uh, naturalness that I will um, uh, try to defend in the conclusion that actually is much better suited to explain uh, many classificatory practices. So I think it's a lot of information there. Let's try to get things clear. So first, uh, natural kind essentialism. It's uh, roughly the idea that natural kinds have uh, real essences, which are important properties that determine the membership conditions uh, necessary and sufficiently. Right? Uh, it is generally um, another tenet of um, essentialism that essences are responsible of the other superficial properties of the kind. For instance, in the, in the case of gold, um, which is considered to be a classic example of an essential natural kind, uh, the essence would be the atomic number 79. And it's, we can see uh, clearly that this property is the essence of gold because to be gold, something has to have this essence. And if something has this property, necessarily it is gold. Okay? Moreover, if we want to explain some properties of gold, like its melting point, density and things like that, we would do so by, by uh, referring to, the, to this uh, atomic structure. Uh, generally, essentialists uh, uh, put forward more conditions for naturalness. For instance, they say as well that a uh, natural kind has to um, be categorically distinct from other, um, other kinds. Uh, that means that the difference between, between two kinds uh, cannot be a matter uh, cannot be a matter of degree, uh, but it has to be something um, something like something a, an objective difference. For instance, um, to to explain um, more precisely what a, a categorical um, distinction is, uh, meteorologists, for instance, uh, differentiate between um, tropical storms and hurricane, hurricanes uh, on the basis of the uh, force or the strength of the wind. And when the wind is more than 120 kilometers per hour, it is a hurricane, and when it is less, it's a tropical storm. Well, there is an objective difference, but it's not a categorical one because we could have just agreed on, um, well, drawing the line in 125 instead of 120. Whereas in the case of a chemical element, uh, elements such as gold, uh, if we go and compare uh, gold with the next uh, element in the periodic table, which is mercury, uh, mercury has the atomic number 80. So there's there a jump, a categorical difference between these two kinds. Okay, so natural kinds in the essentialist picture have to, have to be categorically distinct uh, from uh, one another. 
another requirement of uh, essentialism is that um, kinds have to be defined in terms of intrinsic property properties, which is that when defining a term, we cannot make reference to, uh, to other uh, external objects. Again, an example would be, uh, for instance, moon. Um, to define what it is to be a moon, we have to make a uh, um, uh, definition of the form like uh, a moon has to be to be a moon in a certain relation with another object, which in the case of moon is to be orbiting another object, right? So moon cannot be defined in terms of intrinsic properties. So it wouldn't constitute a natural kind for the essentialist, right? So uh, this was just to give you um, an idea of how uh, restrictive uh, natural kind essentialism is. And this is actually one of the main reasons why it has been rejected by so many philosophers, particularly within the philosophy of science. And it's that it is so restrictive that it leaves out from the category natural many uh, scientific categories. And this has been considered one of the major uh, problems for essentialism because, well, it does seem to be a bit weird, the notion of natural that cannot be applied to most, not only to ordinary um, categories, but it cannot be applied to most of our scientific categories. A major battlefield in this has been um, the discussion on biological species, which for a long time were considered to be a paradigmatic example of natural kinds, but that cannot be uh, that cannot be defined in terms of essential properties, particularly since the introduction of, of uh, Darwinism, the idea that each species has uh, an, an essence is very difficult to accommodate, even if there are few people trying to defend it. Uh, in general, people uh, has agreed uh, on the idea that biological species do not have uh, essences. So. Um, being that so, many philosophers have turned towards a more permissive account of uh, natural kind. And this is where epistemic accounts enter into the picture. And epistemic accounts, well, this is actually my uh, a, a, a label that I use to group together different authors that I think share in their accounts some uh, important uh, characteristics. And one of them is that uh, authors within what I call epistemic accounts are very concerned with the role uh, natural kinds are supposed to play within scientific practice. These um, accounts uh, set two conditions for naturalness. The first one is that a natural kind to be, a, sorry, a kind to be natural has to be uh, projectable. And the second is that a kind has to be, to be natural scientific category. Uh, before addressing each of those and explaining a bit more what they are, let me just say that what I'm going to do, as I said before, is to endorse the first condition that I think it's a very way, good way to characterize naturalness, but I will, I will argue against the second one. Okay, so I will, at the end, um, defend that project, uh, projectability by itself is the best way to, to characterize natural kinds. So, projectability. Projectability is a dispositional property of kinds on the basis of which successful inferences can be made. For instance, Raven, it's a projectable uh, kind because on the basis that knowing that X is a Raven, I can uh, infer a number of things of that uh, particular, for instance, that X is black, that it flies, that it has wings, etc., etc. So. Um, somehow, um, projectability tries to capture the idea that some properties tend to be instantiated together. So when we know that a property is there, we can infer with, with a certain assurance that um, other properties will be there too. So it is important to see that projectability, I will later develop this idea, that projectability can... Um, can be manifested or instantiated in many different degrees. And 
very important as well to take into account that projectability is by far considered as the main characteristic of, of uh, natural kinds. To, get, to give you just an idea, these are three different authors, maybe it's not necessary to read them all, that, um, that put projectability in the center of what it is to be a natural kind. Uh, Khalidi, for instance, says projectability is the most widely agreed upon characteristic of natural kinds and may in fact be the very reason for positing natural kinds in the first place. Um, Magnus and Boyd more or less are doing here the same, the same claim. So I want to make two points concerning uh, projectability and is that projectability is abundant and gradual. Well, the abundant means simply that most kinds are projectable. Even kinds such as stone, even if no one considers that stone is natural kind or very few people, um, uh, would constitute um, a projectable kind because on the basis of knowing that something is a stone, I know that it, if X is, is a stone and I throw it into the water, under normal circumstances it will sink. I know that if I throw X into someone's face, it will probably hurt. I know that uh, I can make tools, etc., etc. So the first thing to take into account regarding projectability is that it's very abundant. Uh, it's important as well to acknowledge that it is gradual. That means that probably we can do more uh, inductive inferences about a kind such as sedimentary rock than a stone, which is, well, few, probably um, much more few inference, fewer inference will be will be done concerning uh, uh, kinds just stone. And uh, what, but in any case, what, what this um, abundance of projectability amounts to is that by itself, it cannot draw an important distinction among kinds. Because we see that, well, if most of our kinds are projectable, projectability by itself does not tell us much to draw this ontological distinction that dichotomical uh, accounts are, are looking for. So this is why dichotomical accounts provide the second condition for naturalness, which is to identify scientific categories with natural kinds. So let's discuss now this second condition. Well, behind this uh, uh, identification, uh, of course, lies a very um, optimistic attitude towards science and the idea that science is actually the best suited to, to, to carve nature at its joints, right? So, um, the thing is that, well, this uh, identification between uh, uh, scientific categories and natural kinds is actually what I want to to reject, right? This is the second condition that I don't want to accept from epistemic accounts. But one thing is important to take into account is, is that this identification can be interpreted in two different ways. And with this, I'm still uh, uh, struggling a little bit. Um, and uh, I don't know if you, um, if you remember this Plato uh, dialogue from Plato, uh, maybe you read a long time ago, um, in which it's the Euthyphro, in which uh, he discusses, uh, Socrates is discussing with, um, with Euthyphro about what it is uh, piety or virtue. And uh, well, Socrates is asking so many questions to Euthyphro and at some point Euthyphro provides a definition of, of virtue and it's something like virtue is what the gods love, right? And uh, then Socrates says, well, it's a good definition, but, and he sets a dilemma, which is, well, do the gods love it because it's virtuous, or is it virtuous because, because the, love, the gods love it? Right? There's here an issue of priority, and I think that something similar can happen in this identification between scientific categories and natural kinds. In the following way, we can say scientific categories track natural kinds because those 
kinds that scientific classification are talking are natural, or instead that something is natural because it is tracked by scientific categories, right? So the first way to formulate it is scientific categories succeed in tracking natural kinds. So they are especially suited to there are natural kinds are there in nature to be found and scientific categories manage to track them. Well, the problem is of this interpretation is that remember that we are trying to provide an account of naturalness. So we cannot, it's like just begging the question to include the idea of a natural kind in the definition of natural kind. We would need still, we, we would agree on the idea that, okay, scientific categories are tracking something different from all the rest, but still we don't know what it is that these scientific class classifications are, are tracking. So this um, way of interpreting this uh, identification uh, wouldn't work. It would simply beg the question. The second one, that in virtue of which to be scientific is actually amounts to being natural, is something like attributing a special ontological status to scientific categories on the basis of being uh, scientific. And, well, to argue against this, probably we would need uh, uh, much more time but what I want to say regarding this interpretation it, it, is that it stands in a very idealized picture of science. To consider that something deserves a different ontological status only because it belongs to a certain social practice determined by its different goals, it's, I think, a too bigger commitment and requires a very idealized picture of science to work, and if, if one uh, goes to to see what do we include under the idea of or the category scientific category, we will find that there are so many different things that have so many different properties. Uh, for instance, some of them, some uh, scientific categories would be categorically distinct, or they're not. Some would be defined in terms of intrinsic properties. So, to attribute. Um, to a category, a different ontological status for being scientific, uh, I would say is, um, needs a very idealized picture of science that is actually difficult to hold. So, um, this was to argue against the second condition that epistemic accounts uh, are providing. So, uh, what remains if we abandon the second condition, would be an account of natural kind, kind based only uh, in uh, projectability. Since projectability is both abundant and gradual, we would uh, reach the, the conclusion that uh, naturalness is as well gradual and abundant. And, well, the thing is that, remember that uh, the epistemic accounts didn't like uh, this uh, characterization of naturalness in terms of projectability only, because if it were so, uh, almost everything would be natural, right? Projectability is everywhere, so, so would be naturalness. The thing is that here is where I want to emphasize that by the, the idea, and by emphasizing the idea that naturalness is gradual, we can avoid these weird situations in which uh, a stone and an uh, electron are both uh, natural. If we include the idea that there is uh, an important sense in which these two kinds can be both natural but with a very different degrees of naturalness, I think that this can actually um, um, be a, a very good way to understand naturalness in a way that will accommodate very good to uh, some classificatory practices. So to, to finish, well, this would be somehow the picture, right? Instead of in the first one in which uh, we were drawing some, some uh, dichotomical distinction here, it would be something, something like that. So some of the virtues, well, the first one is that we can preserve the idea that scientific categories will tend to be more natural 
than ordinary categories without making an ontological commit commitment uh, in which we attribute to those category, uh, categories uh, uh, an ontologically different status. So to formulate it more clearly, uh, the gradual account of naturalness preserves the intuition according to which scientific categories are in general the best suited to carve nature at its joints while at the same time acknowledging that this carving can be done in many different ways and that all the non-scientific endeavors might in a way carve it too. I think that uh, in a way the notion of natural kind um, is provided to to give some grounding to classificatory debates and to, to give, uh, to give uh, an alternative to this uh, relativistic pluralism in which everything, everything uh, is, uh, is valid. So with the gradual account, what we are able to do is that remember that if scientific categories are indeed the best suited to work with projectable, projectable um, um, kinds, and if we have defined naturalness in terms of projectability, we will uh, get a view according to which uh, natural kinds, uh, sorry, uh, scientific categories are indeed um, the more natural uh, the kinds in general. And I think that this is um, when we try to, uh, to, to, to apply this picture to some uh, classificatory debates, I think that it can actually uh, uh, um, maybe not explain, but they accommodate well to how they work. Consider, for instance, this case in which uh, some years ago, I think it was in 2006, uh, the uh, International Astronomical Union decided that uh, they changed the definition of planet, and then Pluto was um, demoted fr from the planets list, right? Well, in uh, New Mexico, some, uh, some people decided that since the discoverer of Pluto was uh, from New Mexico, here we are going to keep calling uh, Pluto planets. Well, uh, I mean, I think that this is clearly a nonsense and that the, uh, we should trust in science, not, not in a way as, again, uh, making ontological commitments as to uh, that scientific categories are natural kinds, I mean, sorry, as um, only scientific categories uh, are natural kinds, but I do think that it's important to preserve the idea according to which we have to trust in science to solve some classificatory debates. Uh, finally, I think that this way of understanding uh, uh, naturalness uh, allows for understanding it as a some sort of taxonomic desideratum that can be weighted against other taxonomic desiderata. Let me try to explain this, this idea. If we, if, uh, if we follow dichotomical accounts, and if we take it that there are some exclusive kinds, right, that are the only natural, we, we would uh, think that science is committed to discover those kinds. Right, so that would be the the, the ultimate the ultimate goal of um, of uh, of any scientific taxonomy. Instead, if we understand naturalness as something gradual, we could accept that sometimes we will, even if we tend to favor, in most cases, natural categories, we will accept or be ready to accept that sometimes we will happy with a less natural category, which is still being considered natural, to favor other taxonomic desiderata that in that particular case we might consider actually uh, very interesting to, to pursue as well. To argue for this, I would need uh, to enter in some particular cases of um, um, classificatory debates, but I think um, that again, this idea of naturalness understood as a taxonomic desideratum might as well explain or accommodate to those, um, to, to those um, fields in which uh, many different classifications are being done simultaneously 
even in biology, for instance, there are many different um, ways of dividing species. And it is more or less, in general, accepted that there will never be one that everyone will endorse because they are not trying to discover the natural kinds and the way a species have to be divided. Um, divided. Uh, each of them will try, indeed, to make divisions that make sense in projectable ways, while each of those internal fields will, at the same time, pursue other, um, other um, uh, desiderata that, uh, that might interest them uh, uh, in that particular cases. And that's, that's it. Thank you very much. Or, or that I need something, but how do you grade them, this natural thing? Or well, uh, it's a very good question. I, I don't have the answer. What I, what I can say is that, uh, the, I mean, uh, one, um, one thing to do in this case, even if it cannot be measured, uh, you know, very clear ways, I think, to trust uh, in science, as I said, to, to find, the, in general, the most projectable kinds. Because science, um, in general, will be uh, concerned with tracking regularities in nature. And in this sense, it makes, um, it's reasonable that um, uh, science will uh, tend to favor the categories that are more homogeneous and that uh, in which you can see that the same properties are repeatedly uh, instantiated together in, in a stable ways. It's true that it's difficult to, to, to measure, but I think that this difficulty wouldn't exclude the fact that, or at least uh, the intuitive idea according to which uh, projectability uh, can, can, can vary a lot uh, and can be instantiated in very different degrees, even if measuring it might not be easy. I don't know if I answer. No. Uh, I, I don't know if I understand well, but uh, the, pro the problem is if natural kinds are graduable, or if the categories we use for natural kinds can be gradual, or because with the projective thing, I I, I, I I didn't understand if it was something. The problem is in nature, and there is, in nature we have natural kinds and things that might be have natural kind, have non-natural kind, and things that are non-natural kinds at all. Mm -hmm. Or if that that uh, debate is something that if the categories, I, I don't know, maybe I misunderstand. I uh, I cannot completely follow what you are. I, I many times I was con confusing if the problem was with the categories science, scientists are using, and if they divide properly. Uh -huh. the world in non-natural and non-natural kinds, or if the problem is in nature, and in nature we find things that we consider natural kinds and things that are not natural kinds. Because you many times only talk about natural things, but in the case of Pluto, yeah. for example, that thing is a natural thing there, yes. and the problem there is would be if planet is a natural kind or not, not if Pluto is a planet or not, if planet is a natural kind. I, I mm. don't yeah, it's true that in the case of, of Pluto, it's, it's not about thing because it's an individual, but there the issue was, it was not so much in this case, because it's the, what I managed to understand. Uh, was about Pluto in itself, it was that the new definition of planet, 
uh, was so it was uh, formulated in a way that it excluded Pluto. But then it's, it's about the problem is about the category. If the category works, I don't know. I don't know if the problem is in the things or is in the categories we use. Well, well, there are things that are difficult, that very difficult to categorize. So we think that they might not be natural kinds in itself, maybe because they, that they are a combination of many things mm -hmm. that they don't happen by themselves unless. Yeah, the thing is. Happens. Yeah, the thing is whether uh, some particulars are grouped together in a natural way. Like it would be the example of gold, in which we are not putting together. Well, it's a mass term; it's maybe more difficult to see. But and it would be different to the case of things smaller than Jupiter, with, in which very different particulars are. We have made a, a collection with many different particulars. So, I, I mean, the the idea I want when I say that naturalness. Uh, has to be understood uh, uh, in terms of degree, uh, in, in a gradual way. I think that because nature is made in this way, I mean, is and so. Uh, I mean, I'm not. Is the way I see it. Is the way. Uh, I mean. Yes. Uh, I was thinking this because, for example, in the periodic table. Yeah. There was when they made it, there was a gap of elements mm -hmm. that they didn't found. But by following the numbers, they, they thought there might have, so there has to be a way to find these elements. And what they do nowadays is they, they made them. So those elements will be natural kinds or not, or depend on the category. Of the, same, of the scientific category to consider those things natural kinds or depends on that even if nature don't do them, we can do them. I, I don't. In the case of artificially made, I don't think that this would um, this would um, entail a difference. I mean, I don't think that the fact that it's being made by humans. Because, as you said, many uh, chemical elements are human-made, artificially made, even if we know that something uh, can be there. And I don't think that this uh, somehow uh, could challenge their ontological status or something like that. But I don't know if I'm answering to your question. Uh, I like the idea of uh, debris in naturalness, but I have some doubts on the criteria that you mentioned. I mean, there is uh, predictivity or predictability uh, criteria. Because I don't know, I really doubt that I could write the idea of predictability, but I suspect that it has something epistemic or subjective. Mm -hmm. so and I think that that point somehow goes with the uh, from. But what I mean is, you say something like that predictability has to do with uh, the inferences mm -hmm. that it can give rise to. So yeah. that um, a property is more predictable than another one if it gives rise to more inferences. Something yeah, like that. yeah. And therefore, the more predictable property will be somehow more natural. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But the thing is that. Uh, Given rise to inferences, at least in principle, and here goes the, the my, my main question, seems to be something epistemic mm -hmm. or subjective. It's subjects that can uh, make inferences. And therefore, it looks like it seems to me that you have like two uh, leads mm -hmm. that you can go purely epistemic and subjective and say that depending on how many inferences we can do with some property, that would be the more natural one. But I guess you, I, I think, uh, from what you just said, that that's not what you what you want. Or do you defend that what are natural kinds by themselves because of some ontological property, I guess, or something, feature, will give rise to more uh, 
uh, inferences in the scientific community. But what I don't see is why it should be so. Why the properties that, at least intuitively, are natural kinds should give rise to more inferences. Because, take for example, quark, which prima facie is a natural kind, and lawyer, which prima facie is not a natural kind. Or if you want, a quark is more natural, a more natural kind than lawyer. The typical layman can make many more inferences with lawyer, with that concept, than with quark. And even scientists, I suspect, many times, can make more influences with concepts like lawyer, or city, or I don't know mm -hmm. how many yeah. non-natural kinds, than with natural kinds uh, like quark. You don't want to say that lawyer is a more natural problem. So, I, how will you, I mean, I would like to know more Yeah, yeah, I think it's a very good question. Um, I, I do think that projectability can be considered an epistemic uh, feature, if you want to call it like that. But I think that somehow, and it's something that uh, I am uh, following from other authors who uh, emphasize this uh, uh, projectability to characterize natural kinds. Uh, and sometimes they, um, they say that it's an epistemic marker of a deeper ontological structure. Because if you can do inferences about a kind, and if you can see that, uh, if you can do these inductive inferences, it's because uh, somehow um, these properties that you can uh, infer, uh, of which you can infer the presence, um, are uh, repeatedly present is because there are causal connections between those properties. And so the fact that something is projectable uh, is somehow the mark that there are there causal relations, and this would be a metaphysical um, uh, property. So I endorse this idea according to which uh, projectability it's somehow the marker of a deeper ontological structure. And in the, uh, the second part with the case of the lawyer, it's not simply a matter of how many we can do, because obviously I can, cannot do inferences regarding the kind quark, and I can do about the kind lawyer. It's uh, more about, I, I, I see a point there, because it's something that I've thought that sometimes, well, can we do many uh, inferences about electrons, or is something that, but I, it's not a matter of how many we can do with our current state of knowledge, it's a dispositional property, and that, that can, uh, inferences can be made is the, uh, our way to access these, uh, these ontological structure is the way. But it's something that I am thinking about it. Yeah. So now it's, it's from the kind from your answer. So now, now I'm lost. So I don't use the idea of inference. <laughs> so I would say you can make way much more inferences from the electron and from lawyer. To begin with, you can infer somehow. I mean, you can actually infer the whole universe for the existence of a quark, including lawyers. I mean, you need a quark to explain why there are lawyers at all. You don't need lawyers to explain quarks. I mean, I know, I, I was talking about it in the sense of you have these basic elements. Like, a okay, quark is a very tricky element, anyway. It's a very, very, very tricky example, an electron too. But anyway, you can have a quark or, a, or an electron or something like a heat particle. And from that, you can build the theory that explains a lot. And by a lot, I mean the universe. <laughs> you cannot do that with a lawyer. But I'm not understanding. So, so what, I, what I meant is I didn't understand. If we, if we take inference to be something that subjective, what kind of inference can I make from the fact that Inigo is here? You know, it depends on my knowledge of Inigo or my knowledge. But that's one kind of inference. But the other one is what kind of logical inferences, mathematical inferences, you can make within a physical theory from a proof that there's something, that an electron. And that, that is huge. I mean, it's not a question of how many things, you know, how much I know about an electron. It's within a theory. If you can prove, you have a logical proof of an existence because that there are electrons, from that, 
you can infer a lot of things. And I'm not saying me and Ekain and Imi or whatever I'm saying, you know, the logical structure of the theory, mathematical structure of the theory, will give you, will help you with these basic elements to give a very comprehensive theory of the universe. And that is a lot. You cannot do that with a lawyer. That's, that's what I meant. I mean, I, what I meant is, what is, is in, sorry, the problem is the inference, I guess, huh? But then I don't understand what you are meaning with inference. So how do you mean that? So that's, that's, that's probably what I, what I meant. If you mean logical inference, mathematical inference, actually quarks and electrons are mathematical entities. They are not even physical entities. The, but from a quark, you can logically infer the universe? No. From, I mean, not, not only from that, but given the laws you have and given the theories you have, that is, given the knowledge we have, uh, if you prove the existence of these elements, atomic elements, subatomic elements, you can build a whole theory that is quantum theory. Can you tell me an example? Yeah. <laughs> yes, that, that, that is a very, very tricky example because more than anyone and lawyers. But, but, you know, I meant, it's not subjective, it's, it's more like, you know, I don't know, but, but maybe I'm wrong, so that was, that was the, so, so, so maybe inference would need to be clarified. Like, what do you mean by making inferences? Because that's, mm -hmm. Because I agree, we tend to think, okay, you know, I can make a lot of inferences from a table, you know, from a lawyer, or, you know, it depends on my knowledge, and then it becomes subjective, but I don't think that's what this would be. I, I think in the case of kinds, it's not so much this, uh, I think, this example in which, uh, which uh, things grounds or are needed to explain other things. It's, the way I see it is that, what can we know on, on the, simply by knowing that uh, a particular belongs to a kind, and what kind of, I don't know, causal commitments uh, something has just for being a member of a kind. And I think that, I mean, knowing yes. that... I but in this that. sense, so that, that would be like, like you say, something like the, the Higgins particle mm -hmm. or something like mm -hmm. that. Well, what kind of knowledge can you infer from the knowledge of, you know, from, from accepting the existence of that is not even a particle, whatever. Well, you can have knowledge about why everything in the universe has a mass. Why do we have mass at all? That's a lot of knowledge. That's a huge inference. That's, that's basically, you know, <laughs> that's huge. So, that's, so that, that would be a case in which you say, if there is a natural kind in this sense, that would be one. Now, there are other problems with that, of course, here, that these are all the different problems that, you know, maybe you're just inventing something, and from that, that's, you know, that's... But in terms of productivity, if you have a proof that that thing exists, from that, that would help you, or that, you know, with that, you can explain why there is mass at all in the universe. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. But I, but I, you want to have another question? Couple of questions. Uh, uh, before the, sure. I mean, I don't think I still understand very well what you mean with inference. But anyway, wouldn't you have? I mean, here goes a more trickier example: disjunctive properties. The what? Disjunctive ah, properties. Yeah. It seems that I don't know electron. The property of electron or proton. It rise to more inferences in your relevant sense than uh, electron. But we don't want to say that these kind of properties are natural or more natural in the degree. So, sorry, what you said is that the so property of the, yeah, but in this group. Yeah, yeah, but I assume that they were non projectable. I mean, it's what I assume, maybe I'm wrong, but what was your example? To be an electron or and it's more projectable than... To be an electron. It's more projectable than being an electron. I don't know how can that can be. No, maybe not. I, I don't know. I mean, it's something that I... I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, but it's true that... I don't know, thinking that maybe it's true that being an electron or a proton is more projectable than being a smaller than Jupiter. But well, this is something to... Questions. I have a very basic question in general ones, I think. Um, not clear to me whether the topic of your talk was about uh, naturalness 
or about kindness. And it seems that the, these distinctions, mm -hmm. um, at one point I thought it was about natural versus non-natural, right? I mean, non-natural being social, cultural, artificial, something like that. But then at some point, given your example, uh, it seemed to be like, no, it's about kind. But not any property constitutes a kind. I mean, nobody said yes. of things is a kind. So, I don't know whether you have a clear idea of whether you are discussing one thing or the other, or they are both in the discussion. Because it seems to be the things about essentialism and all that seem to be more about uh, kind, the notion of kind versus set or class, uh, yeah. than about natural versus non-natural. So, um, can you clarify that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, I think that uh, sometimes uh, the, the way I have uh, presented it, uh, it's the same discussion is done in terms of, of kindness, in terms of naturalness. But I would say that not, um, I don't think that, I think that I could have uh, do the same presentation and speak instead of kindness, which at the end I think it's the same, amounts to the same question. What does make something uh, to be a kind or a, as opposed to a mere set or collection. So my question about naturalness, I think that there might be some authors that uh, approach it in terms of uh, kindness. But I, th I, th I have follow, I followed, I think, most uh, literature in, uh, in speaking those terms, I think. Well, maybe they are all wrong. I mean, that's the point. I mean, it's like, I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, maybe me, it's I not the best. About artificial kind. Well, but uh, the problem... Not just properties, but of artificial objects or whatever. It's, and it, then you can talk about natural, non-kinds, you know, sets of natural, whatever. I don't know. It probably Maybe that's a very well. So, but probably the, it's not the best uh, term that we have somehow uh, inherited from the literature, natural, because it's true that it seems that you have, are, are making there a, an opposition uh, against uh, artificial, which is not because many artificial kinds are considered to be natural, as I, as I said before. And actually, uh, Mill, who was the first one in, uh, in discussing these issues in those more or less the way we do today, he, he spoke about, I think, real kinds instead of natural kinds. Now we are just maybe doing everyone the same mistake of using the, the word natural. Yeah. And related to this, uh, just, uh, well, I mean, um, does it make sense? I mean, it's sometimes that we don't talk about philosophy of nature or nature philosophy. It's supposed to be, you know, old fashioned and well overcame. And then you have to talk about philosophy of chemistry or philosophy of, of whatever, or biology or philosophy of linguistics. Or, uh, so, wouldn't we win some clarification also if instead of talking about natural kinds, we could talk about, you know, physical, chemical, botanical, uh, because, and culinary, because, you know, natural, I mean, sci and science in general, we also talk about science and say, it's not, I mean, like a very old way of talking about science. Uh, it's not true that we have sciences and quite different, and you know, and that we can have the same kind, which is, I don't know, perfectly clear kind in physics, but not so clear in botanics or in. So they're perfectly scientific, both of them, but they don't agree. Or uh, using. Well, recent paper of reading um, the terminology there, there's flexible. Some terms are flexible, so they are understood both ways. But we, we usually are clear whether we're talking about, whether we're talking strictly about, you know, atomic composition, or we're talking about kitchen, which is a science, to they say now, culinary science, right? They can use tomato as a vegetable, even if we know that it's, it's a fruit. But you know, it's no problem. So, uh, how is tomato the correct co categorization as a botanic or a culinary scientific category? 
meaning vegetable or as a botanic blah blah blah. So it's a fruit. Um, so would it be healthy, like you'd be more precise about? Uh, because what is not a planet, given astronomical science nowadays, can be a planet according to, to yeah. you know, people. Um, so Pluto is a planet for someone, not for some others. Well, I, I would say that mm, to address those particular cases is what's behind the, it's the motivation to, because at the end I don't want, I mean, it's true that maybe we should speak more in terms of, you know, uh, physical kinds or uh, kind, culinary kinds, but at the end this is um, an attempt to do what's the, the metaphysics behind that. And, uh, and I think that when we, I mean, my, my, my goal is someday to, to, uh, to, the, to set somehow the, the groundings, the metaphysical groundings to approach uh, uh, classificatory debates and to see whether, how should we solve them. And I think that to do so we have to, to yeah, to, to, to clarify what's the metaphysic, metaphysics uh, of uh, classification and should we uh, approach uh, classification as a matter of we are trying to discover kinds? Uh, can we, uh, are two different classifications of the same field, of the same objects simultaneously valid? Uh, how, how should we deal with these uh, New Mexicans who want to still call uh, Pluto a planet? Uh, what about maybe non-epistemic values in classification, how, how could we uh, include them legitimately in, uh, in, so I think that this might sound old fashioned, but the idea is to, at some point, to be, uh, to be something to work with in, uh, in particular classificatory cases. I don't know whether I'm, I'm in the right direction, but this is, that would be the goal. Yeah, this was going to be like that. Positive, I mean, sympathetic criticism. Well, I don't know exactly, but it seems to be like um, to suggest that we shouldn't uh, acknowledge a privileged position to science, something like that. Yeah. Maybe I wouldn't put like that. I mean, I'm, I'm, I would say let's grant some privileged position to science, sis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I know this not one big truth, but you know. Yeah, yeah. There are different sciences that can give you different results. That's why I tried. I, I said that the gradual account actually preserves this idea that needs to be uh, clarified. But according to which, if we uh, accept that science uh, tries to work with the most projectable kinds, and if projectability is the mark of naturalness, we can say that even if. We haven't. We shouldn't take uh, scientific classifications, our discoveries, and our, you know they are working what with what really exists and all the rest. Well, but still, we 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 grant them uh, a privileged uh, position to to classify reality, even if they are not uh, is not the ultimate classification. So this is one of the advantages I saw in in formulating naturalness in this way. And just the most important about projectivity. Pro well, first we we, know, we have to know how it's written. Yeah. An A of an I. And I have, have the same <laughs> doubt. And so we don't. <laughs> and that's a joke. But so disjunctive. Okay. It's, it's in I both ways. In the, uh, it's like a, because I changed point, it and I didn't know how it was. And the key point was about that. <laughs> I think it's, it's still it has to be clarified because we don't know exactly what it means that's for yes. a. Uh, because on the other hand, it doesn't seem to be about metaphysics. Uh, inference seems to be has to do with terms, right? Well, it's well, yeah, I mean, um, I don't know. Well, yeah, it's something that so maybe there are two different ways of understanding inference. That is about things, or it's about the terms we use to and the sentences we can. Um, infer from a given sentence which involve terms and not just the categories themselves but the names of them or something like that. So yeah, 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 I yeah. agree. Uh, that's something that must be clarified. I could give the same answer as before. So I think. Well, what 
just on that point, didn't you say it was inductive correlation? You see the yeah. properties going yeah. together, yeah. and then you just make the picture inductive. Yeah. And you'll continue to see those correlations. I mean, yeah, the way I, the way I define it is uh, this positional property. That's why you can sometimes uh, do the inference, sometimes not. The, the thing, the important thing, is that it has the dispositional uh, capacity to 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 be uh, to the inference to be done as uh, this positional property on the basis of which uh, inductive inferences can be made. It's about kinds. It's not, it's intended to be about kinds. But I, I and I think that it's actually a problem of this, all this literature that uh, many people is speaking about projectability and you just jump into it and say, well, yes, and no one is very clear about what it is. But yeah, it's something that has to be worked on. So, uh, so the question I wanted to ask was, you're separating <coughs> our ontology from metaphysics and... No. No. On, on epistemolo epistemology from ontology or right. metaphysics, but not... Yes, no, but you're, sorry. You're talking about kinds, right? Mm -hmm. Outside of any kind of theory of how the universe is, or is that right? Well, I, I'm not sure that, I mean, I mean, I think that when you speak about kinds, you are speaking about the, I mean, you are not speaking about kind terms. You are speaking about kinds. It's not, I mean, you are speaking about the universe, right? Yeah, I'm not saying you're not talking about the universe, but you're not talking about laws or, Interactions between things, I'm getting nervous, but laws of interaction between <laughs> things in the universe, right? You're talking about. Well, I, I think that. Or, well, if kinds. Of objects or properties of objects, right? But I mean, you're talking about the universe, but you're talking about. Because the idea about. The idea I thought is it all sounds very pragmatic. It all sounds very much. Projectability is, is, is like the test of whether your categorization is, <clears throat> is to be favored, is, is how effective it is at intervening in the world or something like this. Uh, you know, you can make predictions, projections of what's going to correlate, but that also involves whatever theory you have of how things interact in the world. So uh, that sort of idea occurred to me. I wanted to ask you about it. I don't know. So this is again I think the similar point, right? That how can we make a some you know, ontological claim about projectability or I mean, is, how can we do the jump? Well, sometimes it's said that to do this, uh, this, uh, this way of identifying naturalness with projectability, I have read somewhere that it is to put the, me, uh, the, how it is? the metaphysical horse before the epistemic chart or something oh, like oh, that, cart, something like that. Well, but I think, again, that it's the best way, I mean, projectability. Oh, you, you ah, yeah, sorry, 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 car before the horse, sorry, yeah, 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 um, but I, th I mean, uh, I think it's the best way we have to track naturalness, projectability, and, you and to lose the idea of naturalness there at all, right, that's, the, I don't know if the two things I wanted to say were related, but, um, if you just put the, uh, if you put the epistemic, epistemic conditions, First, then what's the use of the notion of naturalness at all? You said, oh, we've got this way of dividing things, and this way that's more projectable than natural. It's almost like it just comes on the end. I mean, you know what I mean? Well, I would, I, I, I would have the same answer as before. I, I do think that uh, something being projectable um, to, to, for something to be projectable, it has to be built 
according to certain causal relation and that for some properties to be repeatedly instantiated together, there must be, must be there some causal relation between them. And this is why I think that somehow projectability can be... A causation is a natural relation? Or? I would say that it is, yes. On what basis? That it's projectable? Or? I mean... Um, <laughs> I, I would, I would say here. I would just, you know, I would say uh, until someone gives me a better formulation of what naturalness can be. But until that moment, I would say that this is the best way we have. This is why I could say at this point. So, for, uh, having examples, that's the way. Gold. Uh, from gold, I can't predict something expensive. And then that's, I mean, that sounds like true, but it's not really relevant for your point, right? It's a prediction I can make about gold, but it's, it has nothing to do with naturalness. Right? Well, I would say that it's, it's still relevant, maybe not as, re as relevant as the fact that uh, it's conductive or things like that, which are, I think, more, uh, more uh, fundamental. But I would say that stamp, you know, when you put in a letter, has some degree of naturalness because you can uh, make inference, inferences. I mean, uh, my view is that uh, naturalness is very abundant. It's not very, it's not restrictive at all. It's, um, so I would say that not everything, because you have non-projectable, non-projectable kinds, like GRU and things like that. Why, I mean, GRU? So you can infer it, it has color. What grew? Grew is... Blue or green? Ah, vale. Ah, no, it's, it's like... Grew is like uh, uh, being discovered... How was it? Uh, it's not as, as uh, simple as that. Grew? Yeah. It's to be discovered... I think it's not. It's, uh, it's, it's about the case of the emeralds, and so the idea is that it's like, uh, uh, I think a clear example is non-black would be a non-projectable kind. Okay? And because this is a, I mean, it's not a complementary disjunction, it's, uh, I don't know how the word is, but non-black would be an example of non-projectable kind. In order to find a non-natural kind, we have to go to non-black or something. Yeah. Like, so we are like that. I mean, what I want to say at the end is that we should drop the talk of natural kinds. Okay. Is the way I actually another formulation could be, because and not only because there are no such as exclusive uh, kinds, but because as well in a utilitarian sense, the notion has been so. Uh, overused in many different ways that actually to say that some and, and, and now that I'm, I'm working with that I see that actually I don't um, I don't see any any uh, any use and when sometimes as well philosophers of language say well this is a natural kind and say well, what I mean wouldn't be this example work with a stamp as well so I see things like that and so I think that the, the talk of natural kinds should be dropped because as I, I, as I see it, it's very abundant, and we are not saying much when we say that something is a natural kind. But again, again sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. well, I, don't know. I guess you get into the, the kind of predictions you make, some of them might be aesthetically relevant or whatever, for whatever, some of them might be aesthetically relevant, some of them might be right predictions, in terms of, and you get all these right. values, right? This kind of values in terms of things you, you can infer from gold and some of them are relevant for chemistry, some of them maybe not so much, but maybe they are because you know, because it's super beautiful, it's super expensive and then it is very well researched. Or something like that, I'm just saying, right? You you give it just a question. Yeah, and actually well, the the mere uh, the idea was to go against the economical account, so it's uh, the idea is to abandon the idea that they are on one side natural and on the other non-natural. This is the, the, the idea behind all that. Yeah, but you want to abandon the, 
that, like, that there is a distinction line or something like that. Yeah. But even I have problems to see how, according to your account, for example, gold is more uh, natural than Barbie or something like that. Why Barbie? I don't know. Yeah, um, anything Barbie. you can think. Barbie. Barbie? The, the dog. The dog. Ah, Barbie. Oh, Barbie. 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 either. So if it's the kind of inferences that we are talking about, like the amount of the informational inferences we can ask from the information we have, just by knowing that something belongs to some kind, do we have more inferences from gold than from Barbie? Um, yeah, this is a, it's a good question. I, I think we do, and I don't. Uh, what, what I would change from what your 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 way of putting it is that you seem to rely a lot on on our cognitive uh, capacities to do inferences. It's the only and way I can understand inferences in this context. So that's my problem, I guess. I don't know how to understand the this inference thing. If I'm not uh, taking it as something that we can, we can subject. Yeah? Think of terms of logic or in terms of metaphysics, which has more to do with our knowledge of it. Yeah. Things follow from things. Yeah. You say, or logically, but of from our big goal, it logically follows that it's expensive, no? But you have all many well, things that follow that. that. But, but so we are talking about inferences in a way that it's not that logical inferences. So which but you can infer, for instance, that it is conductive, which could be at least uh, empirically true. I mean, you can have maybe you you depend on some conventions to 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 determine whether it's expensive or not. But for some other uh, inferences, you don't need to rely on conventions or. We need a lot more theory to say that it's to infer that it's conductive. Well, right. I'm not sure it's important that that's what occurs to me, but, so I don't know. I don't know anymore what the metaphysical inferences are, but it seems to me that if we are talking about metaphysical inferences, we are recovering the idea of essence yeah. somehow. But anyway, that, that was my question. My question, I finished the question. Uh, why should we want the degrees of something that we should abandon? Sorry, what's the problem? What should we want the degrees of something that we should abandon? Well, I would say that it's not the same. You, you don't want to abandon that. I, I want to abandon the talk of natural kinds. I mean... Then you, then you don't want the degrees of natural kinds. I mean, it's a way... Careful with that. <laughs> it's a way of... Um, it's a way of uh, avoiding some kind of uh, relativism, of pluralism, of uh, classifications. It's uh, to, to, to speak in degrees allows, me, allows us to say, well, this category is much more natural than this other one. You don't want to abandon the notion of naturalness. Yeah, maybe, maybe. At, or I, would, I should say that I, I, we should abandon the notion of, or the dichotomical notion of yeah. naturalness. Maybe it's a better formulation. Uh, examples. Uh, black would be a natural kind. B uh, the property of being black, black things, uh, natural kind, would be projectable, so could count as. And the non black <laughs> would be non projectable. So, boom, natural. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> no, in this case, in this case, uh, I should say we should say if we follow this, that it's non-natural, because the the mark of uh, of naturalness was was projectability. Yeah. Uh, no. I mean, you want to talk in terms of degrees. So, so talk also with that yes or no. It was my turn. Well, yeah, well, natural, well, but. No, let's to finish. I mean, uh, I go to the beginning. I'm sorry to repeat, but it's like we're missing two things. I agree. For me, black and non, and non black, both are natural. I can agree one is kind, black, the other is not a kind because it doesn't group together things by something they have. Because non black means it means something they have, or something like that. But again, it, I think it's going all through this. This course, we are mixing the thing about the difference between belonging to a set 
and belonging to a canon, it, it seems to be different, metaphysically speaking, maybe involving but not necessarily essence, with naturalness, non-naturalness, which seems like pretty theoretically clear distinctions between, you know, natural phenomena, like species and animals and blah, 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 and other things like money and marriage and blah, blah, which are kinds, probably, but they are not natural in that sense. And then, so, you have natural, non-natural in the world, and then we have in both things, orthogonal, orthogonal, you say, that's another distinction, whether in those realms you have kinds and no kinds. And I agree, maybe in those two are a matter of degree, but they're different. I, I, and scales. I, so you have examples I mean, of non-natural kinds and of natural non-kinds and vice versa. I, 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 don't, I don't see very clearly the distinction there, and I think that actually the, the issue of naturalness is can be more or less translated or uh, formulated in, uh, in, um, in the issue about kindness. And actually, you said that, well, that um, so black and white sorry, things... It sounds, for me, it's clear, non-natural kind, yes, but non-natural. Well, but the, the use of, that you are making of uh, natural is not the one we find in the literature of natural kinds, because you want to say that a stamp is non-natural on the basis that it depends on some social conventions and that is, et cetera, and it is human-made. And this is not actually the use uh, in the literature of natural kinds people is, is making of, of, of naturalness. I think that the, the, the issue is, uh, is uh, what makes something to be a kind. And the, is, the way I see it is the same way to say what makes some particulars to be naturally grouped together to, f to form a kind. It's, I think it's, uh, I would say that it's the same question. And about that, um, for instance, um, uh, Mill says that, says that uh, or said that um, black, uh, white things are, uh, don't, do not form a kind. So it's, the thing I found is that each author is drawing the line somewhere in there and it's, I find it very, um, somehow, uh, once you see so many accounts which, with different conditions, you see that, well, it seems a bit problematic, the aim of drawing the line. But regarding the kindness or naturalness issue, I think that there are, the way it is discussed in the literature, I think it's the two, two ways of approaching the same issue. Thank you. Thank you.